These pricing strategies can help you double your revenue without adding anything to your business. I know that's a big claim, but I learned this from one of my mentors. I remember one time I was chatting to him about some of the struggles of hitting our revenue levels and profitability. And he kind of smiles and he looks at me, he goes, if somebody that knew your business, your industry bought you, what would be the first thing they would change in your business? And I thought about it for a second, and I came up with like a bunch of ideas and he said, nope, none of those. The first thing they would do is change your pricing. Most people do not charge enough for their software or their products in their business or services, period, full stop. So here's the strategies. The first strategy is using the Van Westendorp survey to understand your pricing, willingness to pay, and sensitivity of pricing your customers have. You know, I remember this one time I was working with one of my clients and he had his pricing set up so that it was like really cute, the packaging. He had a software company and like the packaging of all of his software was super simple. It was like one price per month and everything was included. It was like all inclusive for each package for different types of customers. And he wanted to keep it simple. The problem is, is that when you don't have pricing flexibility, like I'm going to share with you, then it's hard to create what's called expansion revenue, where the more customers you get, they expand their, their share of wallet, the amount of money they give you, the longer they stay with you. And it got to the point where it was causing a growth ceiling. So he did a Van Westendorp survey, worked with a team to execute this survey. You can go Google it online. There's a bunch of different articles that talk about how to set it up. And one of the things that he got back as feedback from his target customers is they didn't like the fact that they didn't do per seat pricing. So even though you may think my pricing is simple, my pricing is easy, everybody understand it, it's one price, I don't gouge people by charging them per seat for this, you may find out that the market would prefer to buy. They have an experience that they assume would happen because the way they do budgets and et cetera, that's the way they think that would change the way you price to make it actually easier and convert higher the customers that are buying. The Van Westendorp survey will teach you everything from the willingness to pay. Are they willing to pay for certain features? It'll give you rank order of the features that your customers appreciate, which might give you information into how to package and tier it. It will also tell you what the price sensitivity is in regards to certain packages and what you're charging either per seed or other value metrics to help you get it clear. So if you're not using this survey strategy, to inform your pricing, you are doing it way wrong. It is a must, so please go online, learn how to do it, send it, let me know the results. The second one is using a histogram analysis for your features. Essentially what this means is, in your product, in your business, in your agency, it doesn't matter what business you have, People are buying and consuming different features or different aspects of your business at different levels. You might have 100% of customers use this one feature and only 10% use it over here. And for a lot of CEOs or product managers, they just assume that they understand what the buckets look like. They think, well, most people use this and maybe half the people use this. The truth is you don't know if you're not pulling that report. So you can literally do a database query, that's what it's called. You can pull a report from the usage in the database or get your accounting team to do an analysis and figure out what the breakup is, who's using what, what are the natural breakpoints? Because you can learn so much. You may find out just like my client Mark did, that you have a feature that's only being used by enterprise clients. How did he know that? Well, very few people were using this feature based on the histogram analysis. And then when he looked at the customers that were using it, he realized it was only bigger customers. And essentially it was an integration to Salesforce. So because of that, here's what you do. You literally move that feature all the way to your top tier package in your pricing so that you know if somebody needs Salesforce integration, they have to buy the high level package package, which uh, Salesforce, you know, if somebody's using Salesforce, they have the money. These are for big companies, right? It's an enterprise software and it'll pull them up your pricing tier to force them to use a package that's most appropriate for them. That's just one example. You might do the analysis and realize like, you know what? There's people at different levels that are using this feature and I don't want to make it exclusive to just the top feature. I might make it a paid add-on, right? Another client who did this with their software where they had a connection to QuickBooks and they said, look, 
if anybody at any part of the tiers want to use this QuickBook integration and synchronization, we're just going to make an extra $20 a month subscription on top of what they're currently paying at whatever package they're at. And that was totally fine. So understanding the plotting structure of like where the features lay and who's using what and, and then understanding that information to inform your pricing is a must. Number three is tiered pricing. I've already mentioned a few times, sometimes we call them packages, but when you go to a website and you see the three tiers of pricing, there's a reason why people do this. I had a client once, Jesse, he had a video marketing software and he had one pricing for his product. He, his product did a lot of things, but he's like, I just wanna make it easy for people to buy. It's one price, right? It's like, this is a subscription every month. If you use it, great. If you don't, you can cancel. He just wanted to make it easy. You know, a lot of people have these beliefs about their pricing that stops them from actually increasing the yield and honestly, selling to the customer in a more appropriate way. You know, when I looked at it and I was like, A, we need to do a Van Westendorp survey. We need to look at the histogram analysis. And then we also need to understand the psychology of the customer. See, people coming may be a bigger customer and they may not buy your product because you set the price too low. So the reason why we wanna have packages and tiers is so that we can actually do a bunch of stuff. We wanna price anchor. The top pricing package is there to make the other one look cheap. The other thing, we wanna make it easy for somebody that's on a lower level to come into your world. If you're mid pricing only and you don't have a lower price item, then you might be losing 20, 30% of potential revenue because you haven't made it more approachable. Now those smaller businesses might come in and only use a small subset of features, but over time they'll grow into the higher end packages and that's how you keep them from going to your competitor and growing with them. They're gonna grow with you instead. It is so important for you to understand how to package the tiers so that there's a natural motion, right? You wanna set the caps and set the limits so that each one allows a person to get a ton of value at that level, but there's this natural pull forward into the next level when they hit these caps. It might be the number of seats in the first level package, which is like three. Once you get to four, you gotta to go to the second tier package. It might be some other value metric like limits on either the number of contacts, et cetera but you want to design the tiered pricing so that there's this natural break point of how the size of a customer and the use cases of their needs is mapped to those packages to pull them forward. But tiered pricing, if you don't have at least three different tiers, it could be the same product with the three different pricing and you just have like premium support only available on the high end and like email only support. Like it could literally be that simple, but doing that alone, price anchoring and allowing people to come into your world, it will change your revenue yield in a big, big way. Number four is a value metric. A value metric is essentially measuring something the customer does that tells you they're getting value from your product. Let me explain it this way. My, one of my clients, Daryl, has software that allows companies to reduce their credit card declines. You know, out there in the world as people use credit cards, um, essentially like cards will just decline for no reason because of not having enough information or the banks, the issuing banks are just being super protective. And all of a sudden as a business, if you have thousands of customers, you're not paying attention to all the credit card declines. And if it's 15% of your billings every month getting declined, that should have went through the credit card isn't blocked. And Daryl's company, FlexPay, can help you reduce that by, you know, three, four, five percent. That can mean tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue and time added to your balance sheet that you wouldn't have to spend going and collecting and bugging customers and having customer support or your account managers involved. And what they do is there's two different types of value metrics. There's a functional value metric and an outcome-based value metric. The outcome-based value metric is, is what Daryl does, where you pay him a percent of the amount of money that they're able to recover above your baseline. So if you know that you currently have 12% credit card declines on a monthly basis, and they can reduce that down to 9%, you'll share in that savings with them. That is a beautiful business model because it scales infinitely. Like think about it, it could be like from 10,000 a month all the way to 10 million a month. It scales naturally, it keeps it very simple and it aligns the outcome, the customers wanting with the service or the value product 
delivers. The other one is functional value metric. A functional value metric is limiting the function of the product. And usually it's in the number of seats that you might give to somebody uh, in their business to use your product. It could be the number of contacts in your system. It could be the number of uh, storage that you're allowed to use or upload. And by having a value metric, along with all the other things I've shared with you around packaging and tiering and whatnot, it allows you to create this natural way to monetize. So somebody can be on a low tier package and then still have a value metric that allows them to use more of your product, but for you to capture um, a higher share of wallet without having to make your pricing page complex. And the beauty of that is, especially if you have aspects of your business that has lower margins that you would like, so it costs you money to have people consume more like storage, like you know, customer support or other things that have like real cost to it, then the value metric alignment there can be a double benefit where it keeps your your expenses and your costs linear to the revenue you're collecting from the customer so it doesn't get out of whack. Number five is upsells and cross-sells. This is one of my favorite topics when it comes to pricing because again, all these strategies will make you more money without adding anything new to your business, without changing your code or changing your service. And what's great about upsells and cross-sells is you can literally, I had a client, Bob, um, use this exact strategy. They had a software that sold to consignment shops and they had a sales team and they were selling their software. And I think it was like $3,000 a year, you know, break it down to monthly if you want to pay up front for the year. And what they were trying to do is increase their average order value because they were already having a conversation with the customer buying this software, but they wanted to make more money so that they could afford to pay more to acquire customers through paid channels and pay their sales reps more so they could hire better train, higher caliber sales rep. So when I shared this with them, I said, well, look, you can just upsell or cross sell something else that you didn't even build. So the question that you should ask yourself is what are the other things that are related to buying my software that a customer is going to go have to buy at the same time that I might be able to go partner with those companies and put it together and package it up as a solution? One solution, one price, my sales team sells it, I collect the revenue. And, and many times you can keep you know, 30, 50% of the sale, give the, the delivery aspect of fulfillment to your partner and they're responsible for doing all the heavy lifting. So that hits the bottom line as pure profit. That's why I love this strategy so much. Sometimes I'll call it monetizing the sawdust because a lot of people don't realize that in their business, there's sawdust generated from the activity of just being in your business and you can monetize that. One example recently is, you know, somebody on my team came to me and they're like, you know, I know we're trying to reduce our expenses for running our events because we have hundreds of incredible SaaS founders that come to our intensive, these, these incredible events that we host. And they say, well, instead of trying to, you know, like cut expenses or choose different venues or whatever, why don't we allow sponsors to come that are aligned with the biggest problems that our customers are having in their business? And then they pay to sponsor and it creates value for our customers and it's win-win. And I was like, yes, that, more of that. Because... All of a sudden now we had this sawdust, which was an event and we get to monetize it and align with partners and create value for customers. The upsells and cross-sell opportunity is all around you. You know, just even creating another package, which is the same thing you're selling, but just add a little bit more. So it's more expensive so that you can upsell it to me is a huge benefit. And it's funny because it works the other way as well. I had a, my buddy, Michael Litt from Vidyard. They did a deal with Exact Target because they needed a complete solution for their email product that incorporated video for the sales process. And that's what Vidyard did. So they literally did a deal where the sales team at Exact Target sold on their paper, that's what it's called, as a channel partner, Vidyard to the the customers they were dealing with to get the deal. They had a complete solution. And then Michael got more customers for Vidyard through their sales team without having to add any extra overhead, any cost acquire customers, just by trying to be strategic about the upsells and the cross sells. So for me, this strategy to help you with your pricing to monetize is a must to increase the yield of your pricing. So as promised, five strategies to boost your pricing without adding any new features or changing your service whatsoever. If you want to take your pricing to the next level, be sure to download my Fit 
pricing scorecard. It's literally the scoring system that when I sit down with the client, I want to understand how well they're doing these things. I use this scorecard to help them prioritize and assess their opportunities, help my clients add $200 million in new reoccurring revenue to their software businesses. You could probably apply it to your agency or other business. So be sure to click the link, download your copy. I hope this finds you well, and I'll see you next week.